Welcome to our first episode of the Urban Grief Shamans. For Patricia and myself, our journey to this point has been fun, creative, spirit-driven, and exciting as we learn new skills of microphones, recording, and our favorite, delving deeper into our understanding of grief, spirits, and meaning those walking on a path of spiritual growth. One of those enlightened souls is our first guest to help us explore the relationships of grieving and creativity. Kathy Gleason is the host, and along with her daughter Stephanie, created a very successful weekly podcast called As I Live and Grieve. I would urge you to subscribe to Kathy's podcast if you haven't already. It is quite amazing and very informative. I have Kathy to blame for the inspiration to start our own podcast. Kathy has become my mentor and a friend. Before we join her in conversation, I want to share this perspective with you. Think about the Renaissance in that cool period in the European history when art and culture blossomed. It came after the Middle Ages, which was pretty chaotic with plagues, wars, and social unrest. During the Renaissance, folks like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo created works that still excite us today. They basically turned the tough times and collective heartache of the era into amazing art. Jumping ahead a bit, in the early 1800s during the Romantic era, poets like William Woodsworth and John Keats were all about exploring feelings of loss, longing, and inner struggles in their poems. People really connected with their emotional depth and how they captured human experiences, showing that grief can be a powerful source of inspiration. Now, in the world of music, we've got the blues. This genre popped up in the early 1900s in the United States, and it was rooted in the hardships and sorrows faced by African Americans. Artists like Robert Johnson and Betsy Smith poured their pain into their music, creating something that deeply touched many souls. So that's the end of our history lesson for today, and let's join Kathy and myself in conversation. Um, I'm just delighted to be here with you. Me too. I, I was looking forward to this ever since you invited me. I'm glad to hear this. You've been a mentor ever since Patricia and I were guests on your show, mm-hmm. As I Live and Grieve, and you've been encouraging us to take a leap into podcasting. Yeah, um, I just think you have a lot of, not just experience, but information as well from a different perspective that I think really, to me anyway, it makes so much sense and kind of fills in some of those gaps from the theological background mm-hmm. I had as a child growing up in the Episcopal Church. All those questions I have wondering about, you know, gosh, what about spirits and, and everything like that? How does that all fit in? But uh, many of the things that, that you and Patricia also said just kind of filled in those gaps for me. And I think, well, it likely will for others as well. And there's there are a lot of podcasts out there that deal with grief and death and, and even theology and everything. But I have not seen any with your perspective of the shamanism. I have not seen that. So I think it, it will be a well-received podcast. Thank you. So mm-hmm. in this episode, we want to talk about um, grief and, and creativity. I heard when I was growing up that our best works of art and literature take place during times of upheaval. So I was wondering if you could share the beginning of your story with us. Oh, the beginning of my story, I guess, would be that I was pretty much brought up in a Norman Rockwell-type family. Um, The big difference, and this was in the 50s Uh when I was a very young child, uh, was that in my family, both my parents worked. My mother happened to be the principal secretary at the elementary school right across the street from our house. So I grew up with both parents working, and wound up, since there were no daycare centers like that, most times I wound up across the street at school with my mother, either attending an extra class, like kindergarten Uh was a half day, I went for a full day, just because (laughs) it was free, and then after school, as I grew up and everything, I would be in my mother's office and I would help her, and so that was kind of my background, but in our family, My parents were also extremely protective, and one of the things they protected me from, of course, were any of the negative emotions or experiences that we might come across. I remember when 
Each of my grandparents died. This would be my mother's parents. They died within a month of each other. And I have vague recollections of curiosities about what had happened and wanting to go to the funeral home. But Mm -hmm. my parents said, no, no, you stay home. A funeral home is not a place for children. So I did. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I even ventured near a funeral home. And oddly enough, that was on Halloween when I was on a UNICEF drive and we happened to take our little coin banks and go up to the door of a funeral home because the lights were on. That was the closest I'd gotten to a funeral home up to that point. And as I look back at that now, I think that has to account somewhat for the fear. And I mean literal fear I had of the word death as well as the concept. So that became a huge obstacle as I grew to try to cross that barrier. It was not easy. And in truth, I never really became comfortable Mm -hmm. even saying the word death until I was a grown married woman and my mother died, even to the death of my father, an infant son, and then my mother finally, after that, I finally started to become comfortable with that concept. Mm-hmm. It's quite so common it in difficult. our culture, though, isn't it, to it is. not speak of grief or death. And nobody wants to die. And in our culture, right. we certainly want to be beautiful and young forever. <clears throat> and, mm-hmm. uh, and even deep emotions. I grew up in a time when men didn't cry. I can remember my mother, while well, at my wedding, wanted to tell my stepdad I loved him and to thank him for being there for me. I love him. I was starting to get emotional. And I remember my mom looking at me and just shaking her head in the no gesture not to cry. So we get a lot of our priming, I think, when we're young. We do. And, you know, following in the footsteps of my parents with my own two daughters. <laughs> as a single mom, I remember having to attend a funeral. And Stephanie said, can I come along? And I said, no, no, you don't need to go. You stay home. She even remarked in one of our podcast episodes that it wasn't until she was almost 20 that she was going to go to calling hours at a funeral home, and she had no idea what to expect. She was terrified to go because she didn't know what she would see or how she should act or anything. Uh, And then I realized that I had done the same thing my parents had, by protecting mm-hmm. her. Stephanie learned, and when my husband Tom died, she, of course, the entire time he was ill, had been talking to her two boys. And both boys were at calling hours, they were at the funeral home, and even the youngest, who at the time was in sixth grade, he did a presentation that was their annual project uh-huh. before graduating elementary school. He did his annual project on Agent Orange and how it impacted Tom's death and stood up there, tears streaming Mm -hmm. down his face, words stuck in his throat, but he stood up there in front of parents and teachers, faculty, administration, and talked it out. And I was just, I was awestruck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You must have been very proud, Art. Yeah. You said you never understood what grief was about. I didn't. I I don't think I even spoke the word for years and years. I had no need of it mm-hmm. because it didn't happen, or at least I didn't. I didn't attribute it as happening. And again, a late adult discovery is that I don't believe that I ever grieved the death of my father or my infant son. I didn't. I didn't know that's what I was feeling. And at that time, you just sucked it up and moved you know and three days later back to work and just a normal day mm-hmm. they were just gone period mm-hmm. yeah so do you remember when it was that you felt that you hit that point in your life where your grief became bottomless all-consuming i do actually um it wasn't until after my husband tom died and We had known for eight months Mm -hmm. that the cancer that he had was not curable, and I watched him decline. And by that time, I had been working in hospice a little bit, so I was aware of some of the signs 
when a person is actively dying, mm-hmm. the modeling of the skin and the legs and everything and how it will kind of creep up the body. And I was seeing all those signs in Tom. And then I went in, of course, the, the day that I knew he was going to die that day because he had that gurgling breathing, that kind of death rattle, they call it. And I was ready for it, but it didn't impact me. It wasn't really for, I want to say, a couple weeks after we had the celebration of his life. Mm -hmm. And I was at home and realized that not only had I not had a shower in days and not changed my clothes, but I also had not left the house. That even to let the dogs out, I would open the door, hook their chain on them, and let them out. I hadn't even gone out on the deck of my house. And it hit me then, and I thought, if I don't do something, I'm going to live the rest of my life like this, and I don't want to live like this forever. And at that point, um, I did what I always turned to, and that was music and books. Mm -hmm. And I put music on. That way, it's probably a little somber, but at at the time it was what I needed, and it released some emotions. And I sobbed and sobbed for hours, and then I grabbed a book that a friend of mine had sent me, and started reading it. It was poetry, it wasn't applicable to grief at all, but I just got lost in the words. And then that afternoon, I got up and I took a shower and put on clean clothes, went to the grocery store, and really just from that point on started making changes. Mm -hmm. Does it ever come back and bite you? Your grief? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, usually on the the anniversary of his death. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the anniversary of my mother's death. I know approximately, but I don't know the day or the year at this point. I do for my son, but not for my father. But for some reason, Tom's day of death is easier to remember than his birthday. Hmm. And and I don't know why that is. But on those days, sometimes it will come back. Sometimes at a parade, because he was retired U.S. Army Mm -hmm. and belonged to the Vietnam Vets of America. They usually march in parades. So sometimes when I see them, I'll start to get very teary-eyed and very emotional because I know that Tom was just so loyal to them. But, uh, yeah, there are times. It's never as bad, though. That was the worst. Mm -hmm. That was the bottom for me. Kathy, I can only begin to imagine the depth of pain, possibly fear, and isolation that you were facing at this time. It reminds me of what Francis Weller, the author of The Wild Edge of Sorrow, um, and I know you've read his book, describes as a rough initiation this isn't a journey we willingly embark upon, is it? It's more like we're trying to just hold on tightly to what we cherish most. In our grieving, we, we, we do change. It's as if we lose part of our identity and find ourselves pulling away from others. And from my shamanic perspective, grieving is deeply spiritual work. It's challenging, raw, and it can feel incredibly lonely. But the ache in our hearts is also a profound connection to our soul. And it marks the start of a transformative journey, one that might even lead us to our first steps in creative expression. I was wondering, does this resonate with you? I think it is, especially looking back. At the time, I don't think I was aware of that concept. But looking back, I remember talking to my daughter on the phone and saying, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I feel like I'm redefining myself. I'm no longer the person I was before. And during the eight months when I was taking care of Tom, I didn't really realize how much of my life and how much of me I had given up gladly to help him. But I was just gone. I, you know, had nothing, no activities, none of the friendships or relationships except for work. Mm -hmm. And that was in in the hospice industry. But I said, I'm redefining myself. I didn't look at it as being creative. For some reason, to me, grief was an end. It was an end. That was like (laughs) the stopping point, everybody off the bus. This is the end of the road. 
I, I don't know why, but as I started to work through some things and started to read more and get out more and do more things, I realized it certainly isn't the end. And my grief for me almost became a catalyst. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So in that way, and, you know, I've always been kind of creative. I am today, I am somebody I have never been before. I used to be an introvert. I'm not necessarily an introvert. Sometimes it takes a little bit of a nudge mm-hmm. to get me going. But it just, you know, there's so much that I feel has to be done. And I want to be a part of doing it mm-hmm. and finding creative ways to do it. And, I, you know, I think I'm trying to stay more open to the signs along the road and, and you know, say, oh, yeah, all right, I'll go that way and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Kathy, I think you'll find this interesting. Coming from a shamanic viewpoint, the initial stages of intense grief for us are, is like a dismemberment. This is a time when everything feels scattered and disorientated, and giving as a grieving deeply, I should say, uh, can change you profoundly. In shamanic dismemberment journeys, it's like being broken down completely right to your core, to your very essence, and grief is very much like this, as we both can agree on. This process can be experienced in different ways. Sometimes it's enveloped in a sense of love and care, but at other times, I tell you, it can be quite scary, just like grief, when we just don't know where the bottom is. The second part of this journey is crucial, and this is when the spirits start to remember you, to bring you back together. But the remembering feels different. You emerge as a new person, and you find that by the end of this journey, their capacity or your capacity for compassion and love towards others has grown significantly. Oh, yeah. You know, we... Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I admit I'm an entirely different person, but the, the part that's kind of difficult for me, really, uh-huh. sometimes is to... When I stop and think about it, I have to say that right now I'm probably the happiest I've ever been in my life. You know, it, and it, I never thought I would be able to say that. Mm-hmm. So do you think you're closer to whatever your purpose was for you coming into this this world? I think so. I don't mm-hmm. think I'm there yet, but I think so. You know, it'd be nice if I had a road map, so I don't know for <laughs> sure, but but we don't. You know, it's left to interpretation. So um, I, I don't know yet, but uh, I don't I don't think I'm done by any means. Yeah, you're, I mean, with the, your podcast and you worked in palliative care, oh, there's just such a strong connection to the topic. And yeah. I'm wondering if that was kind of part of what you're supposed to be doing in this lifetime. I think the connection is there somewhere. I don't know. Uh, Again, I don't know. One of the areas of uh, the entire palliative care Mm -hmm. hospice and everything like that that really will make me get on my soapbox, so to speak, is the idea of people who are diagnosed with a terminal illness and reach that point where they just want to end their own life there's all the legalities, of course, that say, oh, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. And you can't help anybody do that. But a part of me just wants to shout out, you know, if it's if you have a terminal diagnosis, what difference does it matter when? So I kind of struggle with that in my own mind, back and forth and back and forth, that um, there are some issues, not just that one, but there are other healthcare related issues that the legalities get in the way. The people telling you what you have to do, what's right and what's wrong, doesn't seem fair. I would like somehow for there to be, for people to have more freedom to choose Mm -hmm. their path. Not necessarily be able to kill themselves legally, but at least have more autonomy, I guess, in those choices. Yeah. Well, so I wonder often, you know, when you walk down the street or you you bump into somebody you you don't know, but you have this convert the hearts come together, and you have these wonderful, old and vulnerable conversations with you you have never met before. But when you leave that conversation, you just feel wonderful, and somehow you feel 
uh, that something opened up in us, and for days we'll be thinking of these people. So, so let's move to creativity and your creation. I mean, did you come up with "As I Live and Grieve"? I mean, it's a very catchy. Oh well, title. The, the entire podcast was almost divine intervention. Whatever divinity you like, <laughs> I, I have mine. I have mine. But um, I had been at a comfort care home, a hospice home in our area, and they had asked me to lead a bereavement group, mm-hmm. which I did. And we had three meetings, and then COVID hit full force, and that was the end of the bereavement group. So as COVID started to wax and wane a bit, they came back and they said, Kathy, would you start that group again? And I said, you know, one of the mantras, if you will, for me of volunteering anywhere is when it gets to the point that I'm giving more than I'm getting, I need to reevaluate. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm doing a lot of preparation and everything, and one or two people would show up. That's just, the purpose is to make death easier to talk about, and a bereavement group's not doing it for me. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't, I didn't feel valued, I didn't feel rewarded, and I wanted to feel something. It wasn't helping me either. And I said, I don't know. We were sitting around the dining room table at the home, my daughter Stephanie was there, and we're going, what can we do? What can we do? Could we do a virtual bereavement group and reach more people? Back and forth, back and forth. And all of a sudden, the word came out of my mouth, podcast. I hadn't been thinking about podcasts. I had never listened to a podcast. I only <laughs> knew they existed and basically what they were. That was it. As soon as I said it, my daughter Stephanie goes, Mom, that's a great idea. I'll help you with that. So she sat down at the table and we started planning. Six weeks later, we had recorded five episodes and we launched our podcast. In that six weeks, we did all our research. We learned what we needed to do. We did our cover art. We got accepted on all the podcast apps and everything. And we launched the podcast. And... As far as the name, we kept going back and forth. And, of course, I always liked the good grief thing. (laughs) I mean, that just, uh, you know, an author relies on words, and I couldn't get away from that one. But there was already a podcast called Good Grief, so that wasn't going to work. Went back and forth and back and forth and trying to think of acronyms. Couldn't come up with anything I liked. And I, I got frustrated one day, and the phrase, as I live and breathe came into my mind and I thought oh wait let's just swap out the word breathe for grieve live and grieve and it just seemed to fit and that's how we got the name and I know I'm going to grieve the rest of my life Mm -hmm. and I was probably grieving long before I even knew I was grieving I don't know how anybody could make it through COVID through the pandemic and not be grieving Mm -hmm. each and every single person lost something or some things, or some people. Yes. We all lost. Even today, our lifestyles are completely different. Mm-hmm. So many more people work from home now than ever did. If they want to run to the store, they can do it in the middle of the day. Mm. Just rearrange their own schedule because they work from home. Did you ever keep track of the number of people that um, you've impacted by your your podcast? Oh, Heavens no. Um, I probably, you know, I, I'm hoping there are many, many that I don't even know about. Because you're approaching, uh, is it 200 episodes? Or have you sub- yeah, got we've got about that? 154, 155 now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, three years of weekly episodes. I think we missed one week in there. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, one week that I did my own thing. And... The initial one when Stephanie and I just kind of introduced ourselves. But, yeah, it's, it's 150-something now. Um, Do you add up all your downloads? <laughs> I don't. You know, I look at him every so often. I kind of get shocked. We have one particular guest who has a huge following, and he's been back on our podcast numerous times. Uh-huh. I just I adore him. Gary Rowe, he's a very prolific author, Christian author, um, his words are, are wonderful, so soothing. 
And every time he comes on, of course, he sends in his newsletter, he sends out that he was on our podcast and he puts the link in there. And, of course, you know, that week alone will have thousands of downloads. <laughs> on a normal week now, I mean, we started out, we were tickled pink when we reached 50 downloads in a week. And now we're, you know, well well into the hundreds, you know, <laughs> 300 or more, um, depending on the episode, the topic, and everything like that. But other than just kind of glancing at it, I don't focus on it. The The statistic that tickles me most probably is that we have listeners in 95 countries around the world and on the platform we use they have a world map and they'll show you where all those listens are and uh, it's kind of neat there's countries i've never heard of Mm -hmm. actually i think there's about 150 countries in the world so we've still got room to grow (laughs) but uh, and i had a, a friend that was going on a tour to uh i think he was going up to the arctic and I said, well, you know, try to find a cell tower somewhere and listen to the podcast so that I can have a download at the, you know, <laughs> North or South Pole. But um, other than that, I don't focus on the statistics. Uh, I am delighted when someone e- emails me, reaches out to me. Uh, they sometimes will refer someone to be a guest or they'll just tell me their own story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that. But, uh Yeah. It's For me, it's just mm-hmm. the number of people that you're touching. And one of our mandates when Patricia and I first started uh, Soulful Sorrows mm-hmm. to promote our mm-hmm. workshops and uh, grief circles, we want to increase grief literacy. Yeah. And, yeah. and through that, people will heal differently. Like, there's nothing wrong with people. And I think you mentioned that in your podcast, your story, uh, that, that grief is just a natural human emotion. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, you know, I just think it's, if you can somehow figure out for yourself because everybody's different Mm -hmm. how to use your grief to make some changes even if it's the slightest change in your routine one day where maybe you get up and go outside for a walk or drive to the park and just sit there on a rock or on a picnic bench and just sit outside for a little while and do nothing Mm -hmm. even if that's what it is just do something a little different and eventually I think you'll get more accustomed to doing things differently to bring yourself through the grief and make some progress so you won't feel quite so desolate and burdened with it Mm -hmm. well that might be a good place to end our conversation for today (laughs) Okay. <laughs> with with uh, Kathy Gleason and, and the wisdom that she has oh. developed over the your two and a half years of podcasting and speaking to all these yeah. wonderful people that you come across. Yeah, I love it. I would have uh it wouldn't be the same without the guests. It really wouldn't. Mm-hmm. All right. You have a nice day. Bless Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Bless you. Bye bye. Grief is a heavy burden to bear and can often feel isolating and overwhelming. That's where grief circles come in, offering a supportive and understanding community to those who are grieving. You can't be both the griever and the container of your grief. This is the purpose of grief circles, to be the holder and the witness to your pain. Your soul wants you to speak of your grief, to express your pain, your loss, and to share your history and stories of that which has been taken. The Urban Grief Shaman's podcast <clears throat> is an offshoot of Soulful Sorrows, a grief-tending website. Here, under the service menu, you will find our monthly circles. Please take the time to take a look and book into one or more of these monthly circles. Thank you for joining us into the world of shamanism and its connection to grief, healing, and spiritual growth. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to subscribe to the Urban Grief Show so you never miss an episode. And if you have any questions or would like to explore this topic further, please reach out to us for comments and support in the world to us. Until next time, may you find grace and insight into your own spiritual journey.